Thank you for tuning into this teaching. We hope this message blesses you. Our mission as Marigold Church is to do anything and everything so that anyone and everyone can encounter the real Jesus. We hope as you listen to this, you encounter the real Jesus. Let him transform your mind, transform your heart, and encounter you today. Today, we are talking about repentance. And uh, I told my mom earlier, I said, I, I, what I need to do getting on social media and just t- saying that we're just going to talk about the love of God every week. We're just talking about the love of God every week and everyone will show up. And then I'll do the old bait and switch when they get here. And, uh, but, uh, but today we're talking about repentance. And uh, repentance is actually not a word that you hear a lot in church anymore. I remember growing up, we heard that, 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 uh, that word every week. Uh, seems like, and, and I know that more and more you hear it less. But as we get into repentance, uh, I, I want to explain a couple things. I want to explain, first of all, we're going to talk about what it's not, and then we're going to talk about what it is. So if you're taking notes today, or if, you, if you're not sure of when, when would start taking notes today, would be the perfect Sunday to start taking notes. Last week, we talked about faith. We talked about believing We talked about on the road to salvation, there's four major things that that are important sanctification to this saving process. Number one is to believe, is to have faith. Number two is to repent. Number three is to be baptized, water baptized. And number four is to receive the Holy Spirit down every week why these are important if you've missed any of them just go back the first week I kind of gave an overhead or really two weeks I gave kind of an overhead of what salvation is what is the purpose of salvation what is it why does it matter you decide hey I in in seeing the holiness of God or the righteousness of God then all of a sudden you realize wait a minute I need to be saved I can't do this on my own. I cannot save myself. What do I got to do? So the first thing is to believe. And we, we, we uh, read about it in Acts chapter 2. And uh, actually, um, Rebecca, if you will go to, uh, you know what? I don't think I, I, don't think I put this. But um, in, in Acts chapter 2, it talks about how Peter preached. And then after he preached, the people asked, what do we do? Because we believe, what do we do? And so he said, uh, apostles said uh, for him to repent, to be water baptized, and to receive. And so that's why we're doing it. They believed. So now then they repent. And then they're water baptized and then they're going to receive. Talk about what repentance is not. What is what repentance is not. Now, understanding faith or believing and repentance go hand in hand. So I don't want I don't want this to trip you up if some people will say, well you repent first and then you believe, and then others will say you believe and you repent. They really go hand in hand. Because it's the foundation for salvation, right? So just like the, the floor that you are uh, sitting on, it is foundation, and it's made of concrete and rebar, okay? And you cannot say, well, one is more important than the other because together they fall, you know, they're, they're really, they, they, it's what keeps each other bonded. The rebar is what keeps the believing, or the, the rebar is what keeps the concrete bonded together. Just like repentance is what keeps your believing bonded together. So it's, it's a reinforcement of what you believe. Okay, so that's why when we talk about them so closely linked together. Isaiah 28 uh, verse 10, it talks about how we grow line upon line, precept upon precept, little by little. And so repentance and believing are found. Because it's not, it's not a one and done thing. It's a lifestyle thing. It's, it's something that you continue to do. And it's actually, the, the closer you get to God, the more you find yourself and having to believe differently or think differently. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But first, what repentance is not? Repentance is not regret. We all have regrets. 
When I was young, I had the older I get, the more regrets I have. And regret is about is about this remorse or this idea that, you know what, I, I just, I feel so bad. Why did I make that decision? But it's a decision that affects you. Why did I date? Why did I take that job? Why did I say this to that individual? It's, it's something that you had control of. You did something and you have a regret. This, it's a negative feeling toward a decision that you made that affected you. That is not repentance. That is regret. Regret. Now, regret can lead to repentance. Regret can say, you know what? Man, I messed up. But it can stop there. So uh, regret is not repentance. The next thing, remorse. Remorse is not repentance. Remorse is, is, is a negative feeling towards what I have, a decision I've made, what I've done, else and it, and it and it hurts someone maybe maybe it was an, a relationship that that you broke up because of your actions a brother a marriage maybe it was something you did to your children that caused separation but there's a there I feel so bad because it's not because of how it affected me but because of how I see it affects the people around me but the problem with regret and remorse is they're not re regret and remorse can can lead that way. It can it can it can be a path towards that, but it's not that. Let me tell you why. Because there's two things that we can do to justify remorse. OK, so there's those two things that are not repentance. But then there's two things that we can do that will actually uh, uh, kind of nullify or stop the path to repentance. Maybe I, f I have regret or I have remorse, and that may be towards the path of repentance, but I can cut that off one of two ways. First of all, by complaint. Complaint. I can complain my way out of regret and remorse. Well, you don't. The only reason I did that was because of the horrible, horrible parents that I had. That's what caused me to make those decisions. And if you, you don't, you haven't heard how bad a job, how bad my boss was. You didn't hear how bad my wife was. You didn't hear how bad my husband was. You didn't hear, you don't understand and you complain and complain. And, and, and you know, if, if, if I was the right race or if I was the right color or if I was on the right on the right side of the tracks or in the right country or in the right city or on the right side of town and so you begin to complain your way out of regret and remorse so you can stop it you can stop it the other person if you start comparing well it's easy for so and so of course he could repent look at the people he had around him look at the support system he had that's one form of, the other form of comparison is, well, at least I'm not like so-and-so. I mean, I know we're all bad, but at least I'm not as bad as, and you can fill in the name of the person you just thought right now. <laughs> at least I'm not like so-and-so. I'm comp To them, I'm not really that bad. So I don't really have a, that much to be regretting or, or remorseful for, because, you know, I mean, we all know them. Let's talk about them for a while. But that is not repentance. And so things that, that are not repentance. And so sometimes you can feel bad about something. And sometimes you can, you can disguise something for repentance that's not repentance. You can um, show remorse and regret. But it's really not about the, the fact that you got caught for doing the thing that you did. That's not repentance. Repentance is not, man, I feel so bad that you found out. Guy's been stealing from work. Hey, we're going to go, oh, man, oh, my God. Man, you feel bad about stealing? No, man, I'm losing my job. Everybody steals. It's not a big deal. Let's talk about what repentance is. Repentance comes from the word, it's a Greek word called metanoia. Metanoia. 
I don't, I'm not going to tell you how to spell it. You just have to guess. <laughs> metanoia. I'll spell it for you. M-E-T-A-N-O-I-A. Metanoia. And it means this. It means after thinking, you think again. And it's not just thinking twice. It's not like, well, I thought about it. and then the It's I thought about it. And then I realized my thinking is flawed, so I need to think about this again, but from someone else's perspective, a different standard or a different point of view. So after thinking, I'm going to think again. So repent is to rethink. Pent, from the word pensive, right? So pent. A word that means to be engaged in or reflecting deep or giving serious thought to pensive so repent to give serious thought again to something and it's and it's more of mind it's a change of mind in a sense that I'm rethinking this and I'm rethinking this from a standard that is not just a standard it's the standard Jesus says, I am the way, the life. So it's not like, well, he's one of several. He's whatever I'm feeling at the moment or, you know, whatever. It's whatever you choose. And we all have our own truth and all that nonsense that you hear. No, there's one. If it's true, it's true. And there's only one truth. And that's Jesus. That's it. He's the standard. So it's to see things from his point of view. To view what I'm seeing in myself, not from this point of view or this complaint point of view, but really to see it from the Trinitarian point of view. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, how they see me. You know, the, for the church is uh, we, uh, to do anything and everything so that anyone and everyone can encounter the real Jesus. In order for us to encounter the real Jesus, we have to come to him and looking for real, for reality. You know, the, the, the Greek word that we get the word truth from, or, or it's the same word for reality. When Jesus says he is, I am the reality Everything else is, is fake. Everything else is, is, is a, uh, a substitution. But he's the way. Now, repentance, three things. Or it begins at the realization of these three things, okay? Now, there's always a healthy fear in repentance. And it's, and it's, and it, I'm not talking about like, I'm afraid of, God, but in a way, you know, I was never afraid of my dad until I did something wrong. Other than that, we were good, right? But when I had done something wrong, even if he didn't know something wrong, I was afraid. One time, I've told this story before, and my parents will remember this. I, we were playing football in the neighbor's yard, okay? Now, lived across from us was Miss Ford. Miss Ford had the nicest yard of anyone within a five-mile radius. She had a beautiful yard, not a weed on it, never got past a certain length. That was like her pride and tired, and her kids were grown, and she had one baby, and it was her yard. And that is what all her thing. And so if you're going to play football, you're not going to play in our raggedy yard we had stickers and weeds and, and I'd like some, weed, you know, shed and had thorns and stickers. And this is nonsense. You can't play on that. And so we went to go play in Ms. Ford's yard. The problem was my dad had told us we could not play in Ms. Ford's yard. Okay. I showed him. Yes, we. And uh, we did. And, uh, and so uh, we were playing football, just some me and some guys, and my, 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 my boys, they're from the neighborhood. And so we're playing, we're playing football in Ms. Ford's yard. Dad's inside, either, I don't know, cooking or what. 
but we're outside and we're playing in Miss Ford's yard. We did throw a couple. I, let me give you a little credit here. We did throw a couple of passes in our yard and then walked over to Miss Ford's yard. So we weren't completely disobedient. <laughs> over there and we're playing and someone fumbles the ball. I jump on the ball and then you hear someone say, dog pile. And you hear, you know, just everyone started jumping on me and then you hear, a snap. It was my thumb. And that was about the time everyone's like, man, I got to be getting home. And there I am standing outside, fearful of my father. With my broken thumb, I mean, I was, my hand was like this, my thumb was like facing like a downward trajectory. It was just there. And uh, I did not go inside the house because I feared my father. I waited for a while. My mom got home and uh, she said when I pulled up, I was about as white as a ghost. And she knew, she rolled down the window and said, what's wrong? <laughs> I showed her my hand. And by that time, it looked like, uh, like someone had, had stuck a, a tennis in my skin. It was that swollen. And, uh, but yeah, I was afraid of my dad. Why? Not because he was scary but because I had done something wrong. And I, I knew I had already gotten partial payment for it, which was a broken thumb, but um, I was the rest of, the, rest of the, the payment that was due, if you know what I mean. And so, but there's three things. There's a healthy fear in, 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 uh, in repentance. But number one, when you come to this realization, repentance, number one, that it's God's law you have violated. It's God's law you violated. In Psalm 51, David writes this psalm when he had led a man to his murder, had cheated on uh, that same man, uh, cheated on his own, he had adultery with a woman, caused her to be pregnant and all this stuff. And in Psalm 51, he writes, to you alone have I sinned. It's God's law we violate. When we sin, yes, it has effects towards our brother, our sister, our, our family, but it's God's law we have violated. It's his law. It's to him we sin against. To num number two, it's God's wrath we have provoked another word you don't hear a lot in church wrath God's wrath it is his wrath we have provoked because I have sinned against him now I have payment due to him I didn't want to go inside the house because I knew due to my father God's wrath you have provoked and number three it's God's mercy you have need for mercy you have need for so it's God's law you have violated it's God's wrath you have provoked and it's God's mercy you have need for I needed mercy from my father and so I needed a mediator called to to walk me into the house and guard me but it was it was God it's God's law we violate it's God's uh, wrath we provoke, God's mercy we have need of. If you will turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6, we're going to read verses 1 through 7. And we're going to read two accounts, one in Isaiah, and then we'll, we'll go in a little bit to Luke. But we're going to see where Isaiah has this realization Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, and it reads like this, and I'm, I'll be, uh, this will be out of the ASB Bible. Uh, verse 1, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple, which are angels. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. 
And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. It's amazing that the angel said that, holy, holy, holy. He could have said anything, but that's what he says. He could have said, mercy, 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 love, 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 joy, 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 peace, peace, peace. But what does he say? He says, holy, holy, holy. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, so this is Isaiah saying this. He says, woe is me, for I am because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So he sees himself from the right perspective, from the right standard, from God's point of view. He compared himself not to his neighbor. He compared himself to the standard. He compared the standard of holy, holy, holy God. So we can be real self-righteous really quick when we compare ourselves to our neighbor, to our, our, our someone at work, to our boss, spouse, to our kids. We can, we can get self-righteous real quick. I mean, nowadays you can compare yourself to a lot of pastors and, and be pretty self-righteous. But when you compare your and you look at him and you see him in all of his holiness, then you see yourself for who you are. And that's an important thing to, to do. Verse six, then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, behold, he has touched your lips and the iniquity is taken away and your sin is forgiven. I want you to turn to Luke chapter Luke chapter 5. We see Peter had a, a, a very similar encounter, a very similar, but now uh, with Jesus. Now, when you see Jesus, Jesus said, when you see Jesus, you they are one. And so in Luke chapter 5, we're going to read in verse 1 through 11. In verse 1, it says this, Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him, the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Genesaret. So this is Jesus. He's preaching, okay? Verse 2, And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. To one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. There's a, there's a, a bronze statue, I believe it's bronze, in, in Cor there's a, a on Ocean Drive. There's a church that sits right on Ocean Drive. And there, there's actually a couple of them. But one of them has a, a statue in the front. And I think it's actually uh, where Jesus is calming the waves. It, it, it's something like that. But but. It's, 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 so if you're ever in Corpus Christi and you're driving down there, uh, try to see that. I think it's a wonderful picture because it sees, you see Jesus standing at the front of the boat, and I think his hands are, are uplifted or something like that. But that's kind of what when I picture this. is He's trying to get some height. He's trying, it's kind of like up here. I, I, I'm on a platform, not because I'm, I'm exalted in any way. It's just so everyone can see me. And, and as I project, everyone can hear me. But, you know, obviously he didn't have like a sound. He was projecting above the people so that everyone could hear. And so that's why, that's why he gets onto the, onto the boat. It's not so he's not close to the people. It's so that he can be above and project and so that everyone can hear what he's saying. And uh, verse 4. Oh, sorry, verse 3. I'll, I'll go back to verse 3. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. When he had finished, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. 
Simon answered and said, Master, we have worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. Verse six, when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. He sees the power of God. He didn't see the love of God. He saw the power of God, that there was power in doing what Jesus said, that here he is, the word of God, but now he sees the power of God. We're going to do a teaching uh, pretty soon. We'll we'll go through this series. Then we have Easter, and and there's a couple of things I want to teach on. But then we're going to go into a, a series called the Lord's Prayer. And we're going to dissect the Lord's Prayer line by line. But when he talks about the word kingdom, he's not talking about land and he's not talking about people. He's talking. So anywhere in the scripture where you see or in the New Testament where you see the power, I mean, the kingdom of God, picture the power of God. So this is Peter and he sees the power of God. Peter's. He's a professional. This is what they do day in and day out. This is how they they provide for their families and give a a service to their communities. They are fishermen. And he sees the power of God, the holy. In verse 9, for amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Peter. And Jesus said to Simon, do not fear. From now on, you will be catching men. In verse 11, when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed. There was a change in their thinking. There was something that happened. And the first thing that happened, because there's three phases to repentance. Let's talk about these real quick. This first was they were convicted of their sin. We've talked about last week about being in trial in in like the heavenly trial or the heavenly uh, judge judge room or the the courts of heaven. And so this did, right? There's a lot of words that we use when we talk about salvation. We talk about being a witness, right? And uh, giving your testimony. We talk about conviction. Words that, that, that paint a picture of being in this courtroom of heaven. And so we're convicted. You know, when, when Jesus judges or when God judges through Jesus, it's going to be a very... You're either guilty or you're forgiven. That's it. So one way or the other, you're convicted. You're either convicted now or you're convicted then. The difference is if I'm convicted, there's a savior for me. If I'm convicted then, there's, it's, it's done. I'm thrown away. I'm thrown to hell. Remember, God does not send people to hell. He th- okay. That's what you do with trash. You throw it away. And if you don't understand that, go back and get the teaching on salvation. Conviction of sin. The first thing is, it's the thought repentant. I'm thinking different. What used to not be a big deal is now a big deal. You know, one of the things that I see more and more when you see people who are truly saved without even, without having to to, do shake them their words start to change they start talking different and i don't mean like church talk hey brother i'm not talking about that sister and i'm not that's church talk though it's church talk 
it's heavenly talk. We are, if, if, you, if you're a believer and I'm a believer, we're, we're siblings. Because our father used to be the devil, but now it's God. We're siblings. So I'm not against that. When you start saying amen to everything and hallelujah, hosanna, all those things. Most, most people that say those things don't even know what they mean. But I, that's not nice. I know I'm supposed to be. Jeff tells me, can't you just be sweet? But what used to not be a big deal was a big deal. What it used to be no no problem. Hey, you know, throw an f bomb. Hey, everybody does it. You know, it's everything. You know, just just talk nasty, t- laugh at all the funny jokes, tell the dirty joke. Man, when you get saved, you get convicted of that. Like, man, I, I don't think I should be talking like that. And I'm not talking. That's not legalism. That's that's like I I think different. It used to not be a big deal, but now it's a big deal. It used to not steal a couple pins from work. I need a couple of reams of paper. My kids are at school, you know, are, are doing school from home. I, you know, how am I going to pay for this? Oh, I know. The, you just get some stuff from work. Used to not be a big deal. Now it's a big deal because wow, God's my provider. I don't got to be swiping this stuff. Used to not be a big deal to, you know, cheat a customer, up the price just because I can. Where else are they going to? But now, you know, oh, man, you know, I, I, I don't think that's right. You, you, think, you think things through. Overeating is a sin. We, everyone likes to talk about being drunk, but overeating is a sin. You know, one of the biggest sins, and we don't really think about it as sin, worry. Worry, that's a sin. Why is it a sin? You know, if, if Rebecca, my youngest daughter, went to school and she's there and she's worried and, oh, man, I'm just worried. And the teacher, what, what are you worried about? I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to eat dinner tonight. Oh, my gosh. Why, Rebecca? You know, I just don't know. I'm just worried. I don't, I don't know if my dad's going to come through or, you know, I don't, I don't know. Are we going to eat? I don't know. We have a refrigerator full of food, a pantry full of food. Tea, we'll pick up some chicken. We'll pick up some hamburger. Rebecca has no need for worry. But if she's worrying, what is? It's a libel against me. How does that make me look? We worry about things that God says I got you covered. How? That's a libel on our heavenly Father. If I'm good enough to provide for Rebecca so that she doesn't have to worry about certain things, how much greater is our... We don't have to worry about things. Worry is a big deal when you look at it from God's point of view. Gossip. You know, it's funny. I told one of the guys at work that uh, when you think of gossip, for the most part, People think, oh, like, like that's what women do when they go get their hair done and their nails done. They sit there. Like, I've been in construction a long time. And men are the worst. I'm telling you. Like, there's ways of masking it. But man, men gossip. Golly. So it's not just women. It's men, too. We all have a problem. Fornication, adultery. Those things may be not... You should not be a big deal. That's just a little porn. It's not like I'm, a, I'm not like I'm addicted. It's a big deal. So the first thing is you're convicted of sin. You you, you see while, wow, gosh, woe is me, like 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 um, Isaiah says, or even like Peter, get away from me. I'm a sinful man. Then after conviction is confession of sin. So we have, we have thought repentance. We have uh, this thinking again about the way we're, way we're our actions. So we're, we're thinking this thing through. But now it moves into our words. So we go from conviction to confession. Confession. And I, and, and I, and I really mean confessing, co- uh, confessing particular sin. Not, not a generic, Lord, I've sinned today. And 
uh, you know, I ask that you forgive me for my sins. And, you know, I, I did a couple of sins last week. I got to talk to you about those, but just forgive those. And I'm talking about particular sin. Like, like, get real. What is it? Like, what sin are you looking for forgiveness from? Confess it. What is it? God, I'm, I'm sorry. This week, man, I yelled at my wife. I got mad at my kids, and it wasn't even about them. I, I, I took it out on them. God, I'm asking you to forgive me for that. God, this week, it's not even just what we do. Sometimes it's what we, God, this week, someone came in my path, and Lord, you, you put it on my heart. I know for me to talk to them about you, and I dismissed it. I know that was you. Please forgive me for that. I'm talking about particular sin. Lord, when five just past midnight, I got on my phone and was looking up some porn. Father, forgive me for I'm talking about getting particular. Getting real, not just this blanket statement. Get real. What is it? God, you, you put it on my heart, and I know that I should be giving to the local church. But Father, I, I just, I, I just, I haven't been trusting you. Lord, please forgive. It's particular. It's confession. Uh, so I'm convicted of it, but now it's not enough. I'm not just going to bottle in it. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to say it. The third thing is correction of sin. Go from conviction to confession to correction. So we go from thoughts to words to deeds. And it's about putting right what I can put right. You can't put everything right. Especially if you've come to the Lord and, it's, and, and here you are, you're, you're 40, you're 50, you're 60 years old, and you have a whole lot, decades of sin. You can't put it all right. But what you can put right, you put right. Okay? And so here's, I'm going to give you, I'm going to break that down. All right? There's three things that we need to do or three ways that we need to tackle. Is, is, so it's how, how, to be, how to put action into this, how to have this, this correction, how do I correct the sin, or how do I correct this, uh, now I go, I've gone from conviction to confession, and how do I do this? Number one, be serious about it. That's, it seems like it should just be automatic, but you got to be serious. This is this is a true repentance. Like I said, a, is a healthy fear of God. I need to put this right. This is not just, oh, my new, my new pastime. This is what I'm doing for the next few years. I joined a church and it's cool, so I'm doing this thing. Like, no. This business. I have business with the maker of heaven and earth. And he is telling me I got to get something right. I got to get serious about it. So whatever you're repenting, of, make sure you're serious about it. The other thing, be specific. What am I repenting from? Who have I hurt? I've hurt my father, my head, first and foremost. Remember, I've sinned against him. So I've got to get that right. I got to get serious about getting things right with him. But from there, now I got to get particular. And who have I hurt? What can I make right? What can I do? What am I truly trying to make right? Or am I just trying to brush this over? The next thing, so be serious, be specific, be sensible. There are things that you're just going to have to accept that you just can't make right. You can make it right with the Father, but it won't undo it. You know, we see a lot of things where God will undo the present and he'll undo the future. You never undoes the past in the scriptures. He doesn't undo it. He can undo the effects of it 
in those who are, are, are ready and willing to receive that. But it's, there's no guarantee. You know, if, if, if you do drugs all your life and your, 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 your health is out of whack, you're, you're mentally out, you're, you know, there's certain things you just can't undo. And now he and his grace, if he wants to do it, it, I mean, but there's no guarantees. And it's not something that you can do. That's something that he'd have to do anyway. But it's understanding what can be made right and what can't be made right. Sometimes maybe it's a relationship. All right. You broke up. a. Re- All right. You did something to affect someone else. This is 10 years ago. 15 years ago, five years ago, whatever that is. It's probably not a good idea to go chase that person down now that they've moved. They have a new, they're a new husband or it's a, a, a new wife or whatever. Like, leave it alone. You already damaged it. Like, don't go in there like, hey, it's me again. Like, no. Be sensible. Be sensible. All right? And if, if, it's, if it's out of, it's, if it's just something that you can't fix, you got to accept it. There's a story that I heard of a, of, a, of a woman that had gone and she was gossiping. Been gossiping for a long time, gossiping. And so she goes to her pastor and her pastor says, you know, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take this bag of feathers and I want you to dye this feathers. And so she goes and she dyes this bag of feathers, not knowing what this is all about. She's just being obedient. She just trusts, okay, like, this is something. There's something here. Kind of like one of those uh, uh, Daniel, Mr. Miyagi moments, all right? Wax on, wax off. What's this? And so the, she goes and she dyes this bag of feathers. She brings it back to the pastor. They're dried out. They're, they're dyed, this bright color. And so he says, now I want you to go through the town and I want you to spread these, these feathers, these streets, all over this town. Spread them out as far as you can go. Are you sure this is going to? Yes, just do it. Everywhere, everywhere you go, just spread out these feathers. Spread out these feathers. So she does it. She comes back to the pastor. He says, she says, I did it. I dyed the feathers. Now I've spread the feathers. He says, now go and pick them all up. Every single one of them, pick them up. She realizes, I, I, don't, I don't know if I can do that. So, but she tries. She goes back to throughout the town. She'd see that bright color. She'd go and pick that. Oh, there's one. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh, there's one. There's some in the leaves. There's some fell in the gutter. I can't get to those. And she goes and she comes back and she, she left with a full bag of feathers and came back. with. She says, I failed. This is all I could bring back. And the pastor just said, look, that's the way you have to look at your gossip. You've spread a lot of stuff. You could, but you can't take it all back. But if you're ever walking down the road and you see that bright colored feather, you pick it up. Because you know that was yours. And just be sensible. There's certain things that you're not going to, you can't gather them all. But, it, you know, when you get started, whatever you can make right, make it right. And of course, the, the closer to the timeline, the easier it is. As time goes by, you know, those feathers are lost. Some of those feathers are going to be lost forever. But if one ever comes up on it and you know that's yours, pick it up. Make it right. Okay? Try to make things right. So be serious, be specific, be sensible. Now, why is, why is repentance important? Repentance is important because repentance is forgiveness possible. Without repentance, there cannot be forgiveness. Rather in your life, in relationships with you and your spouse, you and your family members, between you and God, without repentance, forgiveness is not possible. Repentance is what makes forgiveness possible, and forgiveness is what makes restoration possible. That's the goal. The goal is to be restored to our Father, our Heavenly Father. You, you, and, and maybe this is something that you have to do with even relationships that you have in your, in your, in your life. You want restoration. Well, there has to be repentance. 
You want true and real forgiveness. Repentance is a vital part of our Christian walk. It's not enough to believe. It's not enough to say, I believe God and I believe him. And, and, and oh, now I'm going to get dipped in some water. And then I'm going to start speaking a funny language. All oh, right. No, no, no. You, you're going to be you're going to have a very messed up walk. Let me tell you that. Back and try to make things right. In fact, I think it'll hinder you. And you're going you're gonna to get to a point where, man, I've been walking with Christ for three years, four years, five years. And if it seems like every time I hit a wall, it's because you're leaving things. You haven't repented. You're not thinking. Well, that, that, that's not a big deal. That, that was a long time ago. No, it's a big deal. When you look at it from God's point of view, it's a big deal. It's a big deal that you still have the habits that you had when you first believed. It's a big deal. Not if you're comparing yourself to your neighbor, but if you're comparing yourself to holy, 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 it's a big deal. Paul, of his ministry, and, and, I've, and I've challenged you to read the book of Acts. I really want you to read the book of Acts as we go through this. And, and I also want you to read the book of Hebrews is really important uh, as, we're, as we're talking about this. Um, so Acts, uh, just if you've, if you've read it in the past couple of weeks, you, you came across Acts chapter 26, verse 19 and 20. And as, as you get to the end of the book of Acts, uh, you see Paul is on this journey. And this is where birthed. the church is being birthed out in, in all the areas of the world and the disciples are going out. But you, you see uh, Paul in this, in this place, and, and he's going be, be, before royalty. He's being accused by Jewish leaders or the, 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 the leaders of the Jewish customs, and, and, and he's having to really go before some great people to, to be justified or to seek this justification. But in, in Acts chapter 26, verse 19, Agrippa, and it says, so King Agrippa. And so what he's doing, he's giving a summary of all of his journeys, okay, of, of his ministry. This is more, it's not just a journey, it's, it's his ministry that he's journeyed through, through uh, town to town. And it says, so King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both of those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout all the region of Judea. To the, to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. You cannot have repentance without act. We talked about faith last week. Faith is an action word. We are not saved by action. We are not saved by works. But a faith that is not dead, a faith that is alive, okay? It is not, we are not saved by works, but if we are saved, we work. That's the difference between live people and dead people. Live people can work. Don't. Same thing with faith. If it's not working, it's dead, and we're talking about a saving faith. If it's a saving faith, it's a faith it, that has action to it. That means I'm putting some action. And that's why this action of, of, of believing and this action of repentance goes hand in hand, just like concrete and rebar. One uh, uh, reinforces the other. And it's a consistency because we still... If Christians didn't sin, this wouldn't be a big issue, but we continue to sin. Now, the idea of sinlessness is that we sin less and less, but we still sin. We still have something to confess. We still have something to re And we'll be doing this until one day. Not only are we saved from the penalty of sin, which is justification. Not only are we saved from the power of sin, which is uh, sanctification we're going through now, we're being sanctified, we're being cleaned up. But then in, in, in our glorification, when we, we receive our glorified body, we are saved from the very presence of sin. But you and I, we have stuff to repent.
Father, I thank you that this week you would challenge us, bring things to our remembrance, maybe things that we've forgotten, or maybe it's not even things that we've forgotten, maybe it's things that we've suppressed because we just didn't want we didn't want to go back to those things. Maybe it's things that you've been trying to bring to our remembrance that we've been giving credit to the devil for. We're saying, oh no, get behind me, devil. Don't bring that to me, but it's not the devil. It's you, God. It's you saying, hey, I want to go further, but until you handle this, we can't. But Lord, whatever that is, I, I, I ask that you would challenge us. We ask you to challenge us. Because that grows our, grows our belief. It grows our consistency. It grows our resilience in you. In this time where many people fall away, when, in this time where many people, their love and their first love are going cold. I thank you, Lord God, by challenging us, you keep our love, the, 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 our love for each other fresh and anew. In Jesus' name. Hey, if this message or any of the content that we've been putting out has blessed you and you're wondering how you can partner with us in generosity, there are a couple ways to do that. You can download the PushPay app and you can search Marigold Church and you can give that way. You could also set up reoccurring giving and it's really user-friendly. It makes it really easy to give. You could also text Marigold to 77977 and give that way. We believe God moves through a generous heart. And so we would love to see what God does through you as you partner with us and as we walk through this journey together.